Welcome to Adventures in Life. I'm Earl Beecher, your host. Our guest today has had quite an adventure in life. He is Dr. Keith D. Clark. With the initials M.A. and D.C.H. behind his name, and I'm going to start the questioning by asking Keith, what does M.A. and D.C.H. stand for? All right, well, your M.A. is your typical Master of Arts degree. In what field? I received that at Long Beach State here in uh, human communication, basically. Dear old Cal State Long Beach, I know the place well. And? Uh, DCH is very unique. It's a doctor of clinical hypnotherapy. Hypnotherapy. Is this where you put people in a trance and pull a Bela Lugosi on them? Uh, that would be one aspect of it, certainly. <laughs> I, uh, I could tell you didn't appreciate that comment. Uh, well, it's not unexpected. Yeah. Uh, it's a much broader field than that. Uh, we use the, the term trance to cover virtually anything. But what we're doing right now would be trance work. It's focused attention, basically. Focused attention. When did you earn these degrees, before or after you had the accident that put you in the wheelchair? Okay. This was all done in, uh, after my accident. After the accident. I'm going to do two shows with Dr. Clark today, and the first one I want to concentrate on the accident and how a person overcomes a handicap such as the one that, that you have and accomplishes the things that you're doing. And then the second show, we will talk more about the things that you're doing. But I'd like you to sort of share with us what happened, how you happened to wind up in a wheelchair. Okay. Basically, it was back in 1983, so that was 12 and a half years ago from this time. And I was on vacation in Florida, playing with some friends out in the water, as I'd grown up with. I, I grew up here in Seal Beach, playing in the ocean. So you're a native, a real genuine native Californian? Uh, actually, fourth generation of Seal Beach. That's pretty good, okay. So uh, having grown up in the ocean here, it's quite different on the continental shelf down in Florida in that it's, it's more similar to Huntington Beach, actually, in that the, the uh, surface, the bottom of the ocean, actually is very shallow. Sort of gentle distance. slope? Very gentle. They have a, what they call an eight-mile reef that's only in 30 feet of water, eight miles offshore. Oh, okay. That so, is gentle. So I was out there uh, playing with my friend's daughter, holding her hand, and we dove over a wave together into what should have been about three feet of water. And the estimates were that it was only three to four inches deep. So I was, And you couldn't see? There was no reason to believe there would be anything different about it. Just dove over a wave as I would any other wave. I wasn't running around playing, diving into a shore break like you'd find here in Southern California. I was about 50 yards offshore when this happened. Yes. So I did the equivalent of just diving headfirst onto the sidewalk is what it amounted to. So I spent the next probably 20 to 30 minutes, we're just estimating time, but bobbing along out in the ocean. One wave would hit me and leave me face down. The next would hit me and leave me face up. And she was screaming for help in the meantime. She, she was playing with her sister on the beach by that point in time. They, they thought nothing unusual about me to be out in the water for hours on end. Oh, I see. So she was not by you in the water when this happened. No. She was on, on the... I wasn't sand. aware of where she was at the time because I was a little preoccupied just looking at the tropical fish swimming all around me as I floated on a warm summer afternoon in Florida. What, what did this have to do with his, uh, treasures and Spanish galleons and things like that? Well, there's some conjecture that uh, Mel Fisher, I believe, is one of the, the more world-famous individuals that goes after galleons. And they'll find they're about 11 to 13 feet below the surface, uh, below the bottom of the ocean, actually. So what they do is they actually suck or siphon the sand up, dredge it up, and then shoot it out through what they call a mailbox, which actually just disperses the water, the sand into the water, so that it flows out and falls where it naturally will. Yes. So one theory is that since they were working a few miles south of where I was and the prevailing current went north, that the sand would actually flow up in that current and deposit itself out as it would on a river delta and created an artificial sandbar in a place which it wouldn't normally have been. I happened to discover the sandbar the way they're trying to discover a galleon. Unfortunately, I was using my forehead as opposed to dredging equipment. I see. And so when you hit this, it broke your neck? And my, my third, fourth, and fifth cervical vertebra right up in here were all fractured. Now, a fracture is something that typically would occur in a spinal cord injury such as mine as opposed to people thinking that your spinal cord has actually been severed. Now, the difference being my injury is similar to squeezing a tube of toothpaste and the center of it just being stuck. 
as opposed to something actually being cut or severed. And what happens in a, in a case of spinal cord injury is that swelling will occur and a bruising will take place. Just if someone were to hit you in the arm and you have a black or blue spot, well that's because the cells have died, that's why they turn black. They regenerate and the bruise eventually goes away. From what they typically have believed, a spinal cord cells do not regenerate. However, there's a little more excitement to that because uh, through the American Paralysis Association and other organizations, they're finding that they do in fact regenerate. And it's a they matter do. of, that seems to be the, the but, newest thing. But very, very slow? We're not sure if it's, a, if it's a slow process or if it needs other things to activate it necessarily. It may have to do with uh, even a mental state or belief system that people hold. Commonly the belief has been that a spinal cord cell does not regenerate. It's almost like a placebo in some respects that if you anticipate that it will not recover, then it more than likely will not recover. In my case, I've never been a real good at accepting authority figures, so I've chosen to disbelieve that and I'm slowly recovering my function. Now admittedly, 12 years is a very long process. Yes, it is. Uh, Christopher Reed, the man that played Superman, has, yes. has recently uh, drawn a lot of attention to this. From What's his injury in the same area yours was? Uh, actually a bit higher than mine, but very comparable as to what's going on. Yes. And unfortunately, it's tragedies like that, that when they happen to more of a celebrity status individual, it draws more attention to everyone at large. Uh, Similar types of things have gone on, certainly with the AIDS programs throughout the country. Yes. As attention is drawn to things, more money gets into research, and a lot of people will benefit on related issues because of the research that's going on. Now, how long, you were in the water, they, they got you out, they discovered your neck was broken? Uh, ultimately, yes. I, I floated up, uh, literally washed up on the beach like a piece of driftwood would. And then they found me lying there, and I was. I felt I was screaming at the top of my lungs, which I indeed was, however my chest was paralyzed, so that I had a very, very weak, very faint voice. I One see. of the reasons I enjoyed Florida is there were only about 12 people on the beach that day, unlike the Southern California populace. It's 250,000. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So uh, later that afternoon while I was in the hospital, they, had, uh, they really didn't want to tell me quite what had happened until we waited a bit longer. And, I was rather adamant about the fact that I'm an intelligent individual, it's my body, I'd like to know what's going on. Yes. And they told me that basically I had fractured the third, fourth, and fifth vertebra and that it typically would result in paralysis, typically from the shoulders down. I responded by thinking, well, I mean, I won't have use of my legs. And they regretfully informed me that probably not the use of my arms or hands, which fortunately I do have quite a bit of use of my arms and hands. Yes. So that started me into a very long process of rehabilitation, which, as far as I'm concerned, is still an ongoing process until I'm up actually walking around again. Currently, I'm four foot six uh, in a seated position. I'm six foot two when I'm standing. Yes. Standing is something that I do a few times a week through assistive devices to, to help strengthen bones, to keep circulation going, uh, so that I'm ready to walk as my body it either. I will recover on my own or as medicine catches up with me so that the new technologies will be assistive in uh, helping me to recover my function. Because of the disabled uh, parking spaces that are in almost all the shopping centers right. now, I think that the people, the population as a whole in California are much, much more aware of the needs of the disabled. Certainly. Than, than you find maybe elsewhere in the nation. I don't know. But I know in more recent years it's been more like this. You mentioned Cal State Long Beach. I recall it was a few years ago when President Horn was the president. That's right. There was some talk about the inability of people in wheelchairs to get around comfortably. And President Horn actually spent a week in a wheelchair going around the campus and he said, yeah, I can see where there's the problem. And he had ramps installed and doors widened and and a lot of things that would make it accommodate. And as a result, we're seeing people who have disabilities out into the mainstream of life much more now than we did Certainly. before. But I want to, I really want to, uh, I guess it's uh, a tender subject, but I'd like to know emotionally how you deal with a sudden discovery that you're paralyzed and you're going to be sitting in a wheelchair. Okay. Uh some people might say it, it's, uh, I deal with it through denial, maybe. 
Uh, I don't look at it that way. Well, it maybe started that way. Uh, in my own personal story, and everybody's got their own story and their own version, just like anybody else walking around. We all have our own lives and our own experiences. Yes. In my particular case, I'd had a significant amount of training in interpersonal communication. Even before the accident? Even before my accident, which I felt was, was very beneficial in my... Had you graduated from college? At that point, I had an AA degree was all. An AA, okay. I was uh, very interested in human communication, and I'd worked in public relations for a few years prior to my accident. So I, I've been a people person all my life. Yes. And one of the things that I was able to do was, at that time, a certain amount of self-hypnosis to help myself overcome things that were going on around me. Now, see, one thing that a person deals with in a case of paralysis is often the lack of input from their body. In other words, my brain is still functioning normally. It's waiting for all of the messages to come through from my body, but it's not getting them. It's no longer receiving them. So your brain is trying to make up reasons or excuses or explanations for what's going on. In my particular case, I can very clearly describe the five different rooms that I was in in my first 10 weeks of rehabilitation or actually stay in the hospital. And yet, I was actually in traction for, I guess, seven weeks. I never left that room. I never left that bed once in those seven weeks. But in minute detail, to the color of the carpet, to the different pictures on the walls, to the different textures and weaves of the curtains of all five rooms I can describe to you, and yet it was always the same room. So my mind was constantly well, coming how, up how with How come things. it was five rooms and one room? I, I'm not sure I understand. In, in my particular case, it was a matter that my mind needed things to do since it wasn't tending to the tasks of maintaining my body to a large extent. Yes. You know, as, as you're laying in bed uh, in an evening and your feet get warm, then you may kick the covers off. Or you get cold and you pull the covers on. Well, my mind was not receiving those messages. You didn't know whether you were too warm or too cold. Exactly. Or any of the myriad of other things that would be going on. As a matter of fact, it's almost amusing to look back on it, but I was in traction for three weeks before I realized that my feet were shoulder width apart as though you're doing a jumping jack rather than perfectly straight together. Mm -hmm. I used to have to have people lift my legs up so, until I could finally see my toes to set them back down so that I would know that my feet were down because I would have the sensation often that my legs were raised, that they were high. It was very uncomfortable. So ad adapting to the lack of feeling or communication right. from parts of your body was one of the major things that you had to become used to. Yeah, absolutely. A matter of, for instance, uh, something that I deal with on a daily basis is a sensation of uh, 10,000 needles sticking in my body, basically. It, you know when you... Uh, Do you have the tingling or the prickly feeling? Or constantly. In your legs? Constantly. From my collarbone down, basically. Any place that would have less than normal uh, feeling. I see. It, it's very similar to if you cross your arm or your leg and it falls asleep, the feeling of being asleep. Oh, yeah, I hate it, that. It starts to come around after a while and you're yes. shaking that it feels heavy. Yeah. That's the way most of my body feels. So you, in my particular case, it took a few months to be able to put that in the back of your mind. To sort of offset it and say, that's normal. It's basically, that's I'll what normal is now. And so having that, it's as though people that talk about dealing with the pain from an injury, it's something that's always there, but you tend to be able to just put it in the background. And it's a matter of focusing on what you want in your life or what you would choose to be doing in your life rather than focusing on the other things. On that point, I want to pause for a public service announcement. Please stay with us. We'll be right back with Dr. Keith Clark. Welcome back to Adventures in Life. We're talking to Dr. Keith Clark from Seal Beach, California. Dr. Clark has just told us about how come he wound up in a wheelchair about for the last 12 years. Dr. Clark, I, I want to uh, ask a rather delicate question. I know that when you're around someone who is disabled, a lot of us don't know how to relate to that person, to, to recognize they're disabled, to uh, take it in stride as if we're callous, or to be overly sympathetic. Or What's, what's the best way to react to someone who is disabled? Wow, that quite a question. And yeah, I know. What I, I, I wish there were a, a very simple answer to it, but it, it would almost be like someone asking me, or asking anyone, how do you ask a person for a date? 
Or how do you? Yeah, no, that's not easy. To, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Or, or how do you know whether it's appropriate to open the door for someone or not to? So it's a very individual type of thing. Now I myself, I was an individual that I've always been very healthy. I'm still very healthy, but very active. Yeah. And yet, I had the same awkwardness around a person with a perceived disability, which is a is a very big point in itself. In that, many people have an outwardly visible disability, such as myself using a wheelchair. But there's a, an enormous disabled population out there which will not have an actual physically noticeable Are disability. Are you talking about emotionally disabled? Well, that would just be one of many aspects. Yes. Right? But getting on to, to more of the, the physical, obvious limitations or, or disability we'd be talking about. And people talk about it as a handicap or a disability or physically challenged. Some people get caught up in terminology. One person will say, you're a gimp, which is incredibly offensive to some people. Oh, somebody's limping, you mean? Uh, just the term gimp is used, which oh, yeah. some well, of the audience it, may be very so offended unfeeling. by that. Yes, I think it's an offensive thing. And yet, uh, where I went to rehabilitation for some point in time out of Casa Colina in Pomona, they actually turned that term around, and a gimp to them is a, physical, a, a physically challenged athlete almost. A gimp out there is almost a, a badge of honor to say you're a gimp because you're you're going out and you're doing something. Now, I see. That wouldn't necessarily be with the way you'd want to go up and address someone in a grocery store. You may be met with all kinds of different feelings. So, it's a again, it's an individual type of issue. I I've, I've had friends who were disabled and uh, it wasn't very long. I forgot they were disabled. I was just dealing with a friend. Right. And uh, the, the disability was uh, it was just part of of them. And we ignored it. I mean, Chuck Healy was a dear friend of mine at UCLA. And I remember I thought of him as a sharp person. We had several classes together. And he decided he wanted to learn to drive a car. So he ordered one that was specially equipped. He had had polio. Okay. And I remember for the first time lifting him out of his chair to put him into the car. And I kept lifting him. He kept going up, up, up. I said, good heavens, Chuck. You're six foot four. He said, I know. And I had thought of him as a short person, you know. Right. He, he was towering over me by oh, two or three inches anyway. Sure. And, but he had had polio before I ever met him, and I had always just accepted his personality. Uh, another friend that we had at the time was the captain of the UCLA football team and a physical perfection as far as, and he had a stroke. Uh, one day he was bench pressing 600 pounds, and the next day his left arm was paralyzed. And he went through, I had known him 25 years before this happened. And I, I went through it with him. And this, this was not like meeting somebody for the first time and knowing how to relate to them. I, I knew how to relate, right. relate to this gentleman. But I think it is so important that we all accept people who have a disability. I mean, it could happen to anybody. Absolutely. We have. Uh... People talk to us about being an able-bodied person or a disabled person. Yeah. And those of us in the disabled community have a term we call, they're called ABs. AB is an able-bodied. But we could actually call it a TAB, it's a TAB, it's temporarily able-bodied. Because just as you said, it can happen oh, just like that. It's a lot for the rest of us to worry about, yeah. But, but you deal with it so well, and now you are a doctor. Correct. You have completed school. Yes. Earned your master's and your doctor's degree despite the uh, handicap in getting around. Right. And you've achieved these things. You've written a book that uh, we're going to be talking about in the next show. Right. But I was impressed with the book. The title is You're Sharp Enough to Be Your Own Surgeon. Yes. Now, that's a challenging title. It intrigues me right there. And uh, the Body Contouring Program. Yes. You're talking about the power of the mind over the body. Absolutely. A disability can just completely shatter some people and other people say, it ain't going to hold me back. That's right. What's the difference? Well, to a lot of people, they'll look at things as a challenge as opposed to someone saying, you can't do that. Some people will say, I can't do that, fine, and they accept it, that's the end of it. Other individuals such as they myself. They just give up. Pretty much, it's in it, not necessarily giving up even as much as, as going along with what someone expects of them. A lot of very well-intentioned doctors, nurses, therapists have a, a certain mindset, a, th a think, thinking, a feeling, a theory about 
what you'll be capable of doing. In my particular case, they felt that because of my injury, if I got to the point that I could brush my own hair, brush my own teeth, possibly even shave. Using that, your hands. Right, that I would be rehabilitated. And they were right. I did that all in my first hour of therapy. I had six more months of therapy ahead of me, and no one had an idea what to do with me because I'd already achieved the goals that they in their mindset had for me. And I was told I would never drive, I would never be out without an attendant. I don't mind telling our viewing audience that you picked me up at my home and you drove up here on the 405, the, traffic, right? the 5, the 605, and the 2. We were on four different freeways coming right. here and you were doing the driving. I, I live alone currently, uh, which is something I was told I would never do. I, matter of fact, I was living in Hawaii for quite a while, and that's why the Kikui nuts, the Hawaiian shirts. Yes, I told you to come formal, and you told me this is formal, so okay. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I have traveled the, a number of different countries throughout the world and look forward to doing quite a bit more. I, uh, hopping on a plane for me requires a bit more effort. And many of your viewers may have seen uh, someone being carted down an aisle on what looks like a, a milk cart or milk tray. And uh, that's what they're there for, is to, to aid people such as myself getting on and off a plane. So the airlines are adapting to it very readily, to helping people get I don't around. Know if readily is quite the word, but they, they are adapting. They are it. adapting. Well, I've seen a lot more people on the rides at Disneyland who come, who come in, the, in the wheelchair, and then they get them on, especially the haunted house. They shut everything down. You're sitting there with the ghosts all around you while you're waiting, yes. while you know somebody you know, is being helped onto a ride or off right. or something. What we're finding is that. 30 years ago, that a person that had an injury such as mine would probably, probably would have died within 10 years because of complications. Our medical technology now is keeping people alive much longer. Longevity in the population as a whole is much longer. Yes. The thing is, the people that were often dying as a result of an, an accident of some sort, maybe an outgoing person such as myself, mountain climbing, motorcycling, sailing, or what have you, are alive and they're young. The average spinal cord injury in the United States is 19 to 20 years old. Now imagine so they have most of their life before them. Very active young people yes. that are no longer willing to stay at home. Now the people, Long Beach is an incredible example. Long Beach, California has the second largest disabled population in the entire United States. I'd never heard that. We're talking over a half a million people with spinal cord injuries in the United States alone. Now, to get some kind of an idea about that, the L.A. Coliseum, where you see all kinds of games played, concerts, that holds 100,000 people. So if you filled that five times over, that's just spinal cord injuries. That's actually a line of people from San Diego to San Francisco, end to end. That's how many people there are in the United States with a spinal cord injury. Which makes them remain in a wheelchair or that's, is They're or pretty worse? much, as people say, confined to a wheelchair, and yet, Again, it's about how you want to look at things. I heard a wonderful saying once. A fellow said, when someone asked him, boy, it's terrible that you're in a wheelchair. And he says, no, really, it's pretty wonderful, because without the wheelchair, I'd be stuck in bed. So it's all about <laughs> yes. doing Is the glass half full or half empty? Exactly. OK. Exactly. OK, I can relate. And I've been very fortunate in that I've typically been the optimist of optimists. Well, you know, the person who gets a spinal cord injury usually is the most athletic type person who's out doing an well, active thing in right. which the injury occurs. As my, uh, I heard, overheard my father one day say to someone, if anyone can enjoy being paralyzed, Keith's doing it. And that's what it's about. We mm -hmm. all have choices. I could sit home with my VCR and my remote control and wait for somebody to come knock on the door with a cure for spinal cord injury. My choice is to go out there and be in the world, to really live life to the fullest. I perhaps even have a better feel and lust for life than the average person because it takes me a bit more to do it. Instead of just parking my car and running to class the way I used to or running into the market to grab something, mm -hmm. it takes an extra 10 minutes of effort to get in and out of the car. These handicapped spaces that are there, I typically won't park in one if I don't need to because I know that I'm very fortunate that my disability, which may seem horrendous to a lot of people, is a lot better than a lot of people because I can get out and do that. I have many friends that can't do near what I do. Really? Are, are there societies or groups where, where people meet to discuss and to help each other? Uh, there, there certainly are, and actually that's probably one of the greatest things to do is to get out and learn from people that 
I'm a young injury in some respects at 12 years. And these guys that have been out, particularly at the VA here in Long Beach, is a great example. These guys have been living with a disability and can tell you little things here and there. Like when it's hot out, don't eat during the day because it'll, it'll cause you to be that much hotter. Or to take mm -hmm. uh, a certain medication will allow something else to happen to take place with you. Little tiny things that you might never think of, never, never know of in other ways is because of somebody that's learned along the way how to do it. Well, I'm sure that you have a lot of suggestions. If someone is disabled and happens to be watching our show, they could learn some ideas from you. We are permitted only to give one phone number, and it happens to be the number of the producer of the show, my co-producer, Elizabeth Calder. But if any of you want to get in touch with Dr. Clark or to find out more about the subject, give Elizabeth a call at the number that will appear in the credits at the end of the show. And Dr. Clark, uh, I think you have a wonderful attitude. And I found most of the people I know who've been disabled, the ones that I know are the ones that are out, not the ones sitting at home, because I run into them out in the world. And they, they tend to share this kind of an attitude like yours, which is very positive and upbeat. And uh, I'm sure that you have the strength to help others. So uh, Dr. Clark is going to do a second show with me. So. Please join us soon again for Adventures in Life, and thank you for being with us this time.